Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to Hike and Draw. Today is our monthly nature drawing workshop where we go over pretty much everything that we do in our online drawing workshops. We're going to go over uh, quite a couple of different subjects today. Uh, in case it's your first time, my name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your instructor. We're going to be going through not only what our goals are as artists in nature, we're going to talk a little bit about the field kit that we prepare and uh, some tips on getting started. After that, we'll do a warm up exercise together, as well as a wildlife drawing. Um, both of those resources were emailed to you, but they're also in the chat and in the links below. And we'll also be doing a nature journaling exercise, speed sketching. So that's going to be how we close the class. I'll give you some pointers on cultivating your practice because the whole point of doing this is to give you the tools you need here at home so that you can take them out into nature and go hiking and do this on your own. Uh, and then finally, we'll conclude with announcements and closing. So if you've never been here before, welcome. The goal of nature drawing is sort of a vehicle. It's We're creating a vehicle to connect more deeply with the natural world around us. There's so many moments that we miss because we're always on the move, we're not paying attention, uh, but art really gives us two things and it gives us intention and it gives us focus. And when you combine those two for a prolonged period of time, you start noticing things that you would otherwise not notice. And what better way is there to document those things by creating a nice drawing. So it's something that becomes a habit over time. The more you do it, the better you get. And it's something that I have completely fallen in love with. And I hope you will too. So when I talk about a field kit, I'm really meaning not the stuff you keep at home, but the things you bring with you on your hike. Um, typically, it's only a couple of things. You usually have a sketchbook, a pencil, and a pen, and that's the baseline kit. It's a very affordable hobby, so you don't really need to break the bank in order to get started. And if you want to do more, let's say you're more of a naturalist, you want to look at things under a microscope and collect specimens, uh, if you want to paint, if you want to do color pencil, that's all stuff that you can modularize or add onto the baseline kit. So once again, the baseline gear that you need on your hike is a pencil, a pen, and a sketchbook. And that's pretty much what we're going to be using today, just those basic uh, materials. So when you think about all of the different things that there are in nature to draw, it can be kind of overwhelming, but that's okay. The idea of using art as a way to connect with nature is finding an area of focus that interests you specifically. I know that we have a lot of bird lovers, a lot of plant lovers here. Uh, some folks are into insects and landscapes. I'm into all of the above. So depending upon what really interests you the most, that's where you should get started and then branch out from there. Um, I'm a big fan of collecting specimens and drawing three-dimensional objects. That's a great way to practice. Unfortunately, since we're all not together today in the same space, I can't hand out little things I've picked up along the way. So we're gonna be using some digital references. Um, it's just important though, when you collect specimens, not to kill or damage a living organism. Uh, I always think that it's nice to, again, practice with three-dimensional objects because it gives you a different perspective and it allows your brain to process the information differently. And it's also kind of cool just to have that artifact with you as you um, continue your practice. So that's the introduction. Let's go ahead and start our warm-up exercise. So I've selected a nature object for us to draw today. We're going to be using our pencil, so get that ready, and uh, regular drawing paper. And I'm going to be switching to my top-down camera right now. So let me get out of the slideshow here. And okay, switching to top-down camera mode. You'll see here also, um, this is my new nature journal I just started a few weeks ago. I like to use a technical pencil because you can just put the tip away and it doesn't get broken if it's in your pocket. And um, I also wanted to share with you, this is my baseline kit. So I keep a, a backup mechanical pencil, a sepia colored pencil, a regular uh, 2B softness pencil with sharpener, and a felt tip pen. All of this fits very nice and neatly into this tiny little case. Uh, it's just a jewelry case, costs 99 cents at the dollar store, and it fits very nicely into my pack. So. Let's go ahead and prepare our drawing surface. All right, and I'm gonna go right ahead and draw right into my nature journal here. And here we go. So what I typically 
invite everybody to do is to create a, mar a margin or a border around their page, right? And this is a way to help organize. Let's say, for example, you have a bigger sketchbook than I do. You have a lot of room to draw multiple things. It's a great way to separate things and stay organized, but it's also a nice way to kind of get um, oriented with the space you're responsible for as the, as the artist. All right, so this is all you have to do. Go ahead and draw a little sketch of a rectangle. It doesn't have to be perfect, okay? And tell you what, I'm gonna bring my camera just a little bit closer. There we go, perfect. So uh, let's go back to sharing screens again. We're gonna talk about the drawing we're about to do to warm up. This is a saucer magnolia. This is a cultivar, meaning that it is something that was created by a person uh, making a hybrid between two different species of magnolia. Um, and these are very common on both the East and West Coast US. And right now they're coming into blossom, uh, especially in my neighborhood over here in Brooklyn. Um, these saucer magnolias are opening up in all the different parks and it's just a really nice sight to see. So this is the flower prior to it opening, okay? Some of them haven't opened all the way yet. And the way in which we're going to tackle this is the system that we're going to put in place throughout the rest of the class. So pay close attention. What we're going to do first is we're going to allocate a little bit of real estate here. And we're gonna think about this like we're an architect and we're gonna plan our drawing out by getting the proportions correct. So looking at that reference photo, again, I put it in the chat. I also emailed it to you. Looking at that reference photo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a series of dots to create a scale model to base the rest of my drawing. So this is the height, okay? And the height I'm measuring is from the uh, tip of that branch, right? That main branch, that little stem that comes up to the flower, to the top of the flower. And then I'm going to put two dots for the width of the flower, okay? So this little diamond shape here consists of only four dots, but wait. What we're going to do next, again, we're thinking like architects, we're planning, we're designing right now. We're going to use more dots to create an outline of this object. And the reason why I selected dots as the form of mark making rather than line at this point is because it's the simplest form of mark making, right? Everybody can draw a dot here. It doesn't matter if you're a professional artist or you just decided to get started today. Everybody here is capable of drawing a dot. So that's why we're gonna start by planning or creating a blueprint here of the outline of our magnolia, All right? Now these flowers are beautiful. They're very uh, lush and sometimes they're white, sometimes they're pink, depending upon uh, what kind of a cultivar they are. But they're very typically planted in botanical gardens or public gardens. And uh, you know, there's, no, there's no doubt about it, they are quite beautiful. Um, I also, think it's nice to concentrate more on uh, native species in these classes, but just because of the relevance of the season, it's spring right now, it's a great opportunity to uh, focus on something that might be in your own backyard even. All right, so what I've done is I've created a quick outline, sort of a blueprint of the magnolia itself. And this is the bud, right, right here at the base, okay? And then we have this little twig that it's coming out of before it meets the main body of the branch, which is going to cut across the page like that. All right. So now that we have, there we go. Now that we have this sort of blueprint in place, we can begin drawing. Technically, we haven't started our drawing yet. This was just the planning phase. What I want you to do is not think about this like a connect the dot exercise. These are guidelines and I invite you to actively edit your drawing, meaning if you notice something isn't the correct proportion, change it sooner rather than later. And you don't even need to erase. Uh, what I look for is an anchor or something that is very clear and easy for me to understand. And I know that right here at the base is probably the simplest part of this entire complex uh, drawing. So what I'm going to do is start by following the guidelines or the dots rather. Okay. And again, you don't have to trace them verbatim, right? Like let's say for example, I wanted to make this little section here a little bit thinner. All I have to do is actively edit by putting my line inside of these dots here. And now I'm getting the correct thickness of that little stem without having to do any erasing or correcting. 
It's just a different way to measure. And if you think about this, like re-measuring rather than um, making a mistake or correcting a mistake, you're going to have a better time of it because it's giving you that intention. It's giving you that ability to discern what works and what doesn't. And then from there, you're able to construct, and I like to use the word construct specifically, uh, a meaningful drawing that is correct in its proportion and also something that just plain feels good to do. Okay, so here's the easy part. Just got this little branch here. You'll notice these little dots, these little speckles on the branch. You know, bark is very much like skin, right? We have pores in our skin and that helps to release uh, things like gases and sweat. And um, typically these types of trees, if they like to grow close to the water, they have a very interesting anaerobic process. So that means that a lot of toxic gases build up within. So in order to release those toxic gases, they're going to create these little um, splits or, or uh, stretch marks in the bark. That's gonna help to sort of ventilate them so that they don't um, poison themselves basically. You can see that with birch trees, cherry trees. Those are the ones that, I, that stand out to me the most. Okay, so now that we're at the base here, what I'm doing is I'm just keeping my eye on the reference. I keep, uh, I keep emphasizing using a reference here because it allows you to notice certain details that you might either um, forego completely or maybe may not draw correctly the first time. And one really nice trick is to just keep your eye on the reference more than on the drawing. So if you're looking at your reference for one second, look at your drawing for half a second, okay? And we'll go through a little bit of an exercise later on emphasizing that. So now that we have the base and the stem and the branch all figured out here, what I'm going to do is just work my way up the side using my pencil very, very lightly, not pressing too hard. And I'm noticing some different ridges, some different um, wavy areas. So you can emphasize those with some very light mark making or some lighter lines. And we'll go over a little bit about, um, let me just switch hands here so that the shadow doesn't get on the drawing. What we're gonna do is just go over a little bit of what we call line weight variation, all right? Now that just simply means that not all of your lines are going to be the same thickness. And it's not to be overly complicated. The reason we do that is to create a little bit of drama or a little bit of contrast um, with the value. And that'll suggest shadow. Uh, wherever you look and you see a shadow, typically on the underside, right, if our light source is coming from the top, if you use a thicker, darker line on the bottom, like in the areas where there's a lot of shadow, you're going to create the suggestion of a shadow, right? And it's going to have a very nice effect, even with just a simple line drawing. Okay, so here I'm using a nice light line. Okay, here's this beautiful petal. Fold it up, getting ready to open up and greet the day. Okay. And I'm just going to very, very lightly get that little mid rib of the flower petal. Okay. Just make sure that it's in proportion here on the bottom. Following the contour. Okay. Now, the whole part about line weight variation. This little section right here is in the shadow. So I'm just gonna make this little section here darker than the rest of it. And it'll help to emphasize that here as well, just like that, okay? Now you can be the kind of person that likes to just do all the line the same weight and then do the line weight variation after. That's something that's totally valid as well. So you don't have to do it specifically this way, all right? So here I am just going ahead and keeping my eye on that reference as I carefully navigate the blueprint that I laid down earlier. Okay. Here we go. Nice little overlap happening over there as well. We have a little bit of texture in here. I'm just gonna leave a little note to make a little fold. And we work our way all the way around. 
make a nice little wrinkle there in the petal. And then it kind of overlaps here as well. Okay. So we get that mid rib from the top. All right, and this is the little area where I wanna show some texture as well. So let's get that line weight down. So I wanna make it a little bit darker where there's a shadow. Okay, so it's definitely over here on the underside. This is gonna be a little bit thicker. So you don't have to press that hard to make a thicker line, right? So if you, if you think about darkness in terms of thickness, like look at the, the thickness of this bottom section here, we can do the same thing here. You're not really pressing hard down on the paper, you're just, um, here, let me switch back to right-handed, that's kind of tricky. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're using the same amount of pressure, but you're just thickening the line. That's also a way to affect line weight, not only with darkness, but with thickness as well. Okay, so if you think about the thicker lines as heavier, for example, that's going to um, basically give you the, the clue you need uh, to get the right form and the right value. All right, so it kind of tucks in a little bit here. I think I will extend that a little bit. Yeah, I'll just extend it slightly. Switch back to lefty, just like that. And then I'm just gonna follow the shape using some very, very light lines. Cause I do want to capture some of these nice dimples, I guess let's call them. And it's looking a little crooked. I'm not left-handed. I'm just trying to make sure that the shadow doesn't cover the, uh, the drawing here, but you get the point. Okay. A little bit more texture on the bottom there. And there you have it, right? This is the beginning of our nature journal entry, our pretend nature journal entry here. I actually have one of these trees growing up the block, so I'm gonna use this as my sketch for monitoring that tree's growth. I did a little experiment with daffodils, um, and basically I took a shish kebab skewer, stuck it in the dirt, and every day I'd go outside and measure the growth of the of a daffodil in, um, complete sunlight, you know, it's not obscured by any shade or anything like that. Wouldn't you know it, that little sucker was growing like an inch and a half every day. And by the 12th day, it was bigger than the stick. Okay, so also the underside of this branch here, like you can add a little bit of line weight variation there as well. Okay. Now, what do we do with all this extra space on, on the side over here? This is one of my favorite things to do. And the reason why is because what we're doing when we nature journal is we're kind of surveying what's happening in our own uh, native environments, right? So whether you live in the uh, US or the UK, East Coast, West Coast, whatever, you're sort of creating a little bit of a, of, of a, a scientific data point or data entry. So for example, today's date is the 10th of April, right? So just by adding the date in the margin, the upper right-hand corner, okay, you're putting a timestamp on your sketch, okay? And then if you're able to identify what you're drawing, so for example, this is a saucer magnolia. So in that little margin right around here, what we can do is write saucer magnolia, Okay, just like that. And if you wanna get fancy, you can go ahead and add the scientific name or the Linnaean name. So we're gonna put um, Magnolia. Whenever you see an X, like if you go to a garden store and you look at the tag on the, on the specimen or on the plant and you see an X, that is a symbol of a cultivar. It means that it is a, um, a crossbreed. Okay. Magnolia ex solengiana, I guess. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. My Latin's off. So um, another thing you can do is you can add a, um, a location, right? So for example, I'm in, um, I'm in Bed-Stuy or Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York. 
Okay, so we have our date, that's our timestamp. We have our subject, which is identifying our sketch and we have our location. Now, other things we can add since this is a black and white sketch is we can add color. Like we can actually write down purple um, and white because they're not purely purple. P-E-D-A-L. Petals, okay. Um, opens, what time of day, right? So opens, um, let's say, after sunrise and closes after sunset. Okay. Now, usually the earlier flowering plants in spring, like they're really greedy for the sunlight because they came out early, it's cold, they're trying to maximize the amount of sunlight they can get before the larger uh, trees kind of uh, release their foliage and, and now they're blocking the sunlight. So they're, they're really greedy for sunlight. So that's interesting. Um, let's say, for example, uh, we want to estimate the height of the tree or you want to measure the size of the flower. All of that is interesting data for you to uh, incorporate in your nature journal. So that's our warm up. That's a great point to segue into our next exercise. And you can see how much of a rabbit hole this, this nature journaling business can be because um, you know <laughs> there's no limit to the amount of information that you can collect and add to your artwork. And it makes it more information dense and interesting. And it also uh, allows you to teach other people what you've, what you've learned in a nice personal visual way. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my camera with you again. Okay. All right, so we're going to draw some wildlife now. We're gonna use the system, the drawing system that we, that we did with our Magnolia sketch, right? We're gonna plan out our drawing like an architect and then we're gonna go and draw on top of that. And uh, we're gonna do a little bit of texture work. We're gonna work a little bit more on things like shading and uh, line weight variation. Uh, this is going to be the subject, the most vicious animal in the forest, deadly dangerous, red panda. It's adorable. <laughs> so this is a um, not a native US species, although they may be present in some preserves and zoos. I only usually like the zoos that are designed for breeding um, wildlife that is endangered with the intention of releasing them back into, the, into their native environments. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conservation work that um, takes place and that's what I'm into. So this is a wonderful example of one of the rare beautiful species out in nature and we're going to start this drawing just the same okay and I'm going to teach you a little bit about how to use this frame as a point of reference for getting the correct scale. So I'll switch back to my top-down camera all right I'll close my nature journal here and I'm going to just pull out a piece of five by seven cardstock and it's just the typical stuff that you'll find in a supply store this is a I got this in the scrapbooking section so <laughs> got a huge brick of this paper for not a lot of money I'm just gonna adjust my camera here here we go all right so like we did before we're going to start our drawing with a margin so let's go ahead and begin just like this It doesn't have to be perfect, just enough to give you some space to write your notes and to have a good working space. I usually leave about around one to two centimeters on either side. Okay, so here we go. What I'm going to invite you to do next is before we start with our dots, <laughs> what we're going to do next is just consider the picture again. And um, I'm going to draw a very, very light, light, light line 
down the center of the page, dividing. Here we go. That's that's better. Okay, dividing it into two different parts here. Okay, and I want to just make it super light. So just erase it to the point where it's barely visible. Okay, then what we're going to do is draw a horizontal line again in the center of the page. And that's going to divide our frame into quadrants here. This will help us in our mission to get the correct proportions before we start our drawing. Okay, so I'm going to try to adjust the light here because the sun went in a little bit. There we go. Now let's look at this panda together, right? We have, share my screen again, quite an excitable looking fellow. You'll notice, let's say for example, this is the middle of the page. Okay, we don't really have too much of the red panda on the right hand side of the page. It's predominantly on the left hand side of the page. Sounds like, yeah, no duh, common sense. But during the planning phase, it's important to know this if you want to get the right proportions. However, if you want to zoom in and make this panda as big as possible, you can kind of pinch in a bit and extend it so that you're only drawing the, the panda and none of the foliage or branches in the background, okay? We'll simplify a little bit. Um, I mentioned the term visual hierarchy. I want to tell you what that means. Visual hierarchy means it's what the main focus or subject of your drawing is, okay? So the, the red panda is the top of the hierarchy pyramid, followed by the branches that it's sitting on, maybe some of the leaves that are blurred out around it, and then finally the rest of it's all, all by the wayside. But this is our primary focus. So going ahead and, and uh, noting that, I'm gonna start by considering the distance of the red panda the backside of the red panda to the leftmost margin. Okay, and it's not really much space there. It's squoze in pretty, pretty much against the margin. So I'll put a little dot there to signify how far it's going to be to the margin. And then it's going to extend slightly past the center of the page. So I'll put another dot here, and this is going to be the width of our red panda. From the top of the page, right? This is a chunky little guy. Maybe he's well fed. Um, let's say, for example, it's about this far, maybe an inch or so from the top of the margin. So that'll help us to get the top of the panda. And then you'll notice that the tail kind of wraps around the body and barely almost touches the bottom. So our diamond is going to be located in this area. So this will be the top, this will be the bottom, this is the height and the width of our subject. And this is going to help us to uh, do our connect the dot uh, or our, our dot plotting to create our blueprint. So I'm gonna go ahead and start right at the back, right in the caboose over here. And I'm going to just plot out the way the tail is. And maybe I overshot it a little bit when I was figuring out the, uh, the proportion here. Maybe it's a little bit higher. That's okay, you're allowed to actively edit, like I said earlier. Okay, and I love the way the tail just kind of wraps up and curls around the branch. I think that's really graceful. I always envy the animals that live up in trees. They're such good climbers. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and I'm just gonna follow the caboose back again and I'm gonna go around to the top now and I'm keeping my eye on the reference. Okay, if you keep your eye on the reference very frequently, like one second up, one second down, one second up, one second down, you're going to be able to get a more accurate understanding of the subject that you're drawing, and then that will translate into a more accurate drawing. Okay, it's all about noticing. It's all about using art as that vehicle to explore, right? And part of that exploration comes from firsthand observation. That's the root of all science, by the way. Okay, so that's just one of the ears I'm kind of just playing around with. I see if I like it there. Here's another ear. Now you'll notice that the head's going to go a little bit further past the dot. That's fine. We have totally enough room for that. It doesn't have to be a perfect um, you know, photocopy. What we're trying to do is allow ourselves to understand the proportions of what we're drawing while we're drawing it. And that, that whole idea of actively editing is going to give you that sort of 
license to explore and not feel like you're going to mess up your drawing if you explore, right? The exploration process is rewarding, not punishing. So for example, if you didn't get the head right, you didn't get the, you know, there's something wrong, that's fine. Explore until you find the right way. And then that's what's going to give you the encouragement and also the ability to grow uh, past your ability in the present. Okay, always try to draw something that you, you feel like you can't draw. That's how you're gonna grow. Okay, so in here, we have the basic proportions. Maybe the snout should be extended a little bit. Keeping my eye on that reference, making sure that it's, oh, it's so adorable. Yeah, <laughs> making sure that it's the correct proportion. I know that sometimes they give animals in captivity names you know, like there's a, a bald eagle that is in a preserve that, uh, you know, unfortunately the eagle got hit by a car and it can't fly anymore. So it lives in a preserve. Um, and you know, I think its name is Sam, Sam the Eagle. I wonder what this animal's name would be. Probably something like Shredder, something brutal. <laughs> All right, here's the tail. Just looking and noticing, we're not really drawing yet. We're just plotting, planning, scheming even. And this is going to give us our blueprint, right? Now you're gonna notice there's a couple of geometrical shapes that stand out like this little triangle right at the base of the tail. Uh, this is where the branch kind of comes in from the side, right? And we have the tail, let me just round that out a little bit. It is perfectly round looking, isn't it? Okay, so we have this tail coming in here, just like that. We have this rectangle shape where the branch is right here. That's where he's sitting on top of. Okay, and we have this other little section of the log or branch. So a log is basically a, a branch that fell or a trunk that fell, really big trunk that fell onto the ground. And it's dead, right? It's not a living thing like a branch is. Now, in the guiding community, what we call a piece of hanging dead wood, we usually call that a widow maker. Because if you're not careful, when you put up your tent underneath something like that and the wind blows, it'll come crashing down right on top of you. So mind where you pitch your tent. Okay, here's this little section of the log that has that little bit of, uh, I guess an indentation. Maybe there was a branch there that fell off a long time ago. All right, so before we get too carried away, because we have a little bit of extra room on the bottom, a little bit of license to explore, let's go ahead and actually start doing the drawing. Because if we sit here plotting all day, we won't actually, <laughs> we'll just be making a dot matrix and not a drawing. So um, the only other thing I wanna add in here is that vine uh, that looks like a very woody thick vine that kind of comes up in arcs like this. And I like the way it frames the head. So that's why I'm including it. Okay, I'm not gonna go too crazy and try to draw every single leaf and every single branch. That's not what our hierarchy is. That's not the, uh, the visual hierarchy um, priority that this is the priority, the red panda. So spend the most time and focus on the panda. Everything else you'll be able to fill in at your leisure, okay? Red panda time. I wanna to talk to you about texture because just simply connecting the dots, you're gonna have a very boring solid white line, uh, black line. So when you consider texture, right? Let me um, flip over my page here. Think about the fur as a single unit, right? If you try to draw the fur like this, right? If we're just using a line and then you go ahead and draw these little things on top, it's not gonna look like fur. Okay, you don't want this. Instead, what you want is to think about this solid line as if the texture of the fur is included with it, right? So it's a single packaged unit, just like this. This is the fur. I'm leaving a little bit of space. It's okay not to have a continuous um, solid line here. I'm mixing in some dots and some dashes in certain areas where there's shadow. But overall, you can see the benefit of exploring the texture of the fur using a very free form and, and dramatic 
type of mark making rather than trying to contain it in a solid line and then adding these little vertical lines to make fur. Do it like this, okay, just like that. Make it loose, doesn't even need to be connected as long as it feels fuzzy or furry. Right, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and start. And I'm gonna go ahead back to the, the main area here, the caboose, and I'm going to just begin my process just like that. And I'm just following the rough ridges of the hair here. And I'm stopping to break it up on purpose because I'm noticing if it's a continuous solid line, it's gonna ruin the illusion. So I'm going to use this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about intentionally leaving some white space or some blank space. And your brain is actually designed to pick up patterns. It's designed to notice things like that. Um, so it'll form a picture on its own. You don't have to literally draw every single strand of fur or um, make it as photorealistic as possible, your brain has the ability to kind of piece it together so that it makes sense, right? And that's kind of the illusion that we can take advantage of as artists. We have the ability to kind of manipulate the page or the drawing to uh, play that advantage, to play to that advantage, right? So the type of fur texture here that I have, if you think about it, I didn't draw every single strand of fur. It's kind of inconsistent. There's a little bit of um, ad lib mark making there, but your brain will process this as fur. Once you get the context of, oh, this is an animal, your brain will automatically associate it with fur. So it'll save you a lot of stress and a lot of work um, by understanding that because you wouldn't have the pressure of trying to get it perfect. Just get it good enough. Okay, break it up a little bit. Leave some white space in between these areas. Like look at the, this little area behind the head, that neck. There's like a slightly lighter patch of fur. One thing you can do is just kind of allow that to exist as its own entity, leaving some white space in between. Noticing the way in which the fur is growing too is really important as it follows the contour of the body. It starts going kind of upward towards the top like this right there at the scruff of the neck. And then it kind of evens out as it gets towards the middle. And once it turns to the underside, it starts pointing in a downward direction because it's following the contour, right, of the body, just like this, okay? So that's a little trick for you to experiment with. Now the ear, same thing. This is gonna act as its own entity, right? We're gonna make this ear separate from the rest of it. It's gonna kind of divide this into more digestible pieces because if you try to tackle this all at once, it definitely can feel overwhelming. But by dividing this drawing into smaller pieces like this, different segments, you're giving yourself, you're giving your brain a chance to relax a little bit and to break down the complex information into a simpler form. That's what's gonna help you to get this drawing exactly the way you want it. Okay, so here's the ear, just like that little bit smoother on the back side than it is on the front. I wonder what these animals sound like. I've never heard a red panda. Yeah, let's get rid of some of these excess marks too. If you have some um, excess mark making, like if uh, you didn't erase all of your dots or if you feel like the dots are intrusive, get rid of them. You don't need them there anymore. Once you get the drawing part started, your blueprints, they're already part of your drawing. You don't need them at that point. Okay, so here's the inside of the ear. I'm not scribbling, I'm just using dots and I'm, I'm getting um, sort of a, a gradual buildup of texture here because I'm not just going in there and scribbling around. I'm, I'm intentionally placing these marks so that they add value um, to that ear structure, it's supposed to be there, right? So I'm keeping that in mind as I'm looking at the way the fur texture differs where it goes from white to red. Okay, and there's some nice scruff right here as well that I wanna get in there just like that. And here's the top of the head right there on the cabeza, all right. 
So there's the back of the ear, a little bit smoother on the back of the ear. So I'll use a solid line right there. So just to show you really quick up close, one thing I'm noticing is I might have to make the nose a little bit bigger. I might have to adjust this down here. Right now it's kind of looking like a bat. That's fine. As I'm going ahead and putting these uh, proportions in, I'm actively editing just like I was before. And um, instead of worrying about erasing, I'm using my blueprint as a guide and I'm able to correct or to more accurately portray my subject because of that. So by taking the time to doing these preliminary steps, I'm gonna wind up with a more accurate drawing. And I'll feel a lot better about it at the end of the day because I'm one of those people like if I do a bad, bad drawing and like I put a lot of effort into it, it'll it'll get on my case for the rest of the day. <laughs> and I'd just rather not have that baggage. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there was one class I did where I totally messed up the drawing. <laughs> we were doing a moose. I think it was like the third or fourth time I ever did this. And I tried to get fancy with um, a textured paper. And like I was using chalk, trying to get like highlights. And it looks like the stupidest moose in the world. And it, it also looked like I wrapped it in plastic because of the white highlights from the chalk pencil. And it, it ruined my day. <laughs> So at this point, I'm noticing, okay, this is where I originally anticipated the snout to be. Now, as I get down um, from the ear over here, right, I'm slowly gradu gradually building up this texture, this fur. I'm noticing, oh, so the, the nose is actually going to be a little bit further out than I originally anticipated. Okay, not a problem. All I have to do is just extend that section of the face just like this. And now I'm right on track again. Okay. Here's where it originally was. Okay, so this is the original area that I estimated. And I, all I did was actively edit past it, right, to make it over here. Now, you can erase this if this is distracting, or you can just draw right on top of it. Because you're dealing with a lot of texture, you won't even notice if you draw on top of it. Um, but I can get why some people might want to have that out of the way. They might view that as distracting, okay? So here's the new shape of the head now, okay? Just because of active editing. Okay. So I get down to the point where the snout meets the face and I'm looking and I'm seeing how it kind of has this, this bridge across the nose, right? This white area where it meets the red. Okay, so you can use your dots there as well because the eye, they have these adorable little white eyebrows Okay, so here's the area where the eye is going to be. I'm not drawing the eyeball. I'm just drawing the area where the eye is going to be because I want to make sure that the fur is in the correct place, right? I have this little eyebrow coming up right there. I want to capture that. And I also want to make sure I keep that little space right here in between the red and the white, okay? Because that's going to give me some clues as to where the eyeball placement is going to go. Right? So by building up all of this stuff around the eyeball itself, I'm putting myself in a more advantageous position because I'm noticing how the pieces of the puzzle inter interconnect with each other. And it has like this sort of almond shaped eye. So if I go like this, that's the eye. I'm happy with that, that placement right there. And you can go ahead and add a little texture or another line to just kind of sink it into the skull a little bit. And whenever I draw an eye, I like to give it a little highlight, just a little area where it reflects like that before shading in the rest of the eye. Because if you don't get that, it's not going to feel alive, right? The animal needs to have life in its eyes. And really the best way to sell um, the illusion of a realistic animal drawing is to get the eye right. So there's the eye. Plenty of space between the head and, and between the ear and the eye on that head. So I'm just going to go ahead and play with my texture a little bit, just dance around with my pencil here. Just like that. And I'm not going to go overkill with the texture, too. That's another thing. Leave some white space, leave some space for the imagination. Again, the brain recognizes patterns, it'll fill it in. 
the rest of the way for you. You don't have to go and make every literal thing. Okay, so there's that cheek, a little white spot there, and I already got the fur on this half. So I'll just finish that up just like that. Okay, and I'm noticing, okay, this is behind the top of the eye and maybe the shape of it can change a little bit. Maybe I actually wanna extend it down there a little bit. So all I do is just actively edit that piece and erase what I don't need. Just like that, just like before. Okay, and it's gonna kind of wrap onto the underside. So it's important, this, is, this little white patch of fur on the cheek is important because it's going to help shape the head of our red panda. Okay, so we also have a nice white snout. Okay, so there's that little area. This is the red space in between the white space. So in that area where the fur is a little bit darker, you can go in and do a little bit of texture. Okay, and you can also move your page around too if it feels like it's uh, at the wrong angle. And what I like to do is just follow the contour of the face, follow the contour of the face. If you're in my uh, bird drawing class, we did one uh, drawing birds in flight on Thursday. I kind of been playing with this new, um, or this, this technique, it's probably not a new technique, but it's new to me, where I'm, I'm really being loose and playful with the line and I'm just following the contour of the, uh, of the surface with my line work. And it adds a bit of energy and excitement to the piece that I was really lacking before. So that's an example of allowing yourself to experiment and try different things because you might happen upon something that really makes you even more excited to draw than before. And that's, that's a huge growth spurt. Because once you get excited to draw more, then you're going to be practicing and practicing and practicing. And that's what's going to allow you to get better. All right, so we have this little nose. Okay, it comes down from here, extends out like that. And then we have the little tip of it right there makes a little diamond shape, like a rounded tip like that. Little nostril in there. Kind of looks like a raccoon. Noticing that similarity right now. Okay, and here's the top of that nose. Walks its way right up like that onto the face. And I'll just extend that a little bit more. There we go. Make those hairs a little bit longer on the side so that that makes visual sense. Don't forget about that line weight variation. There's an opportunity within that nostril, within the top of the eyeball, uh, even within the ear, I think. To get a little bit darker and that'll help you to sell that illusion of shadow. Okay. So I'm not going to rush and try to fill in the nose right away. I'm just going to let it stay a little bit blank for now because I do want to allow some room for fur to grow around it, right? Okay, as it comes up the face like this, wraps around underneath like that. Too cute. Now, one thing I want to talk about is the idea of animals being, or wildlife specifically being cute and how that could get you into trouble. So up in Canada, up in Alberta, they have uh, two beautiful national parks. They have Jasper National Park. And what's the other one? Who else knows? There's Jasper and then there's what? What's the other big national park in Alberta? You can go ahead and unmute, unmute your microphone if you'd like. Okay, Banff, B-A-N-F-F, -F, Banff. Banff National Park is, um, both of them are known for not only their, their landscapes, but their, their wildlife. Now, 
they actually have what they call a bear jam. And a bear jam is when cars pull off to the side of the road to take pictures of the bears. You know, black bears, grizzly bears, mostly black bears. Um, there's so many incidents where a tourist gets hurt because they get out of their car to go take pictures of the cute little babies. Now, one thing you should always remember is not ever to threaten a baby in front of a mother because that's a trigger for uh, an attack, right? So this idea of wildlife being cute seems all well and good, which it is, I guess, in, in a very harmless away from wildlife sense. But once you encounter an animal in the wilderness, it's a great idea to kind of get rid of that mentality for the moment because it's still a wild animal, it's still unpredictable. It still wants its own space. It doesn't want to be cuddled. It doesn't want to be touched, right? And you can avoid a lot of problems just by keeping a safe distance and observing in its natural, uh, the animal in its natural habitat. So while, although these are adorable red pandas, if you ever have the privilege of seeing one in the wild, observe it from a nice far distance, give it its space. And don't touch it. <laughs> so the, the hair, the fur that I'm filling in is the red fur right on the front now. Okay, so we don't get to see the other eye because of the profile of the face. Okay, but I just want to make sure that the hair that I'm drawing, the fur that I'm drawing rather, is following the contour of the skull. Oops, sorry, the shadow is pretty bad there. Let me show you a little bit closer. Okay, there's our dude. Okay. For the back side of the ear too. Just like that. Same thing over here. Follow that shape. Okay, we have some shadow. So I'm just gonna go ahead and outline that area where the shadow is like this, using the dots again, and then just go in there with the pencil and using the line to follow the contour. Remember how it kind of has like an upward angle, evens out straight, and then as it gets to the midsection, starts to downturn a little like that. That's following the natural contour of the body, just like that. In the areas where you wanna show a little bit of texture in the white, just use some dots or dashes. You don't actually have to go in there and shade. Okay, so there's our red panda. Maybe I'm just gonna erase a little bit underneath there because I wanna have a kind of downward angle. With the hair, with the fur. Extend that bottom jaw a little bit. I want to get that lip. Okay. So now that we have that, I'm noticing that there's an angle change that I didn't account for. That's not a problem. Just want to make sure that the Okay, so this goes under the eye, this comes around, this goes up like that and kind of downward angle. Oh, so that's where, okay, cool. So I'll just use my eraser to get rid of some of those marks and actively edit again. Just kind of lower the lip a little because there are these little, nice little whiskers. 
want to be able to get that for sure. Okay. Okay, and there's that little area where the nose is as well. Okay, I'll make that nose a little bit bigger. That feels better. And voila, active editing. Don't forget the other side, this whisker is there too. Nice and loose, nice and light. Here we go. All right, so now for the tail, we have this tail area that kind of comes from over here. Okay, so here's the top of the tail, same thing. As you notice, it's towards the top, the hairs are upturned like that. Okay, and it's ringed as well. Which makes it even cooler. And this little area on the top is a little bit matted there, but then it will just, whoosh, just like that. A little bit of energy. Okay, so again, leave some room for the imagination there. It doesn't have to be a solid. I just caught myself doing what I told you not to. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a solid line there. You can leave a little bit of room. Just use some nice marks there dots, dashes. Okay, you don't have to draw every single piece of fur. There's also some shadow happening. And we're gonna, I'm gonna use these dots to sort of emphasize the places where we're seeing a lot of shadow here. Okay, so typically, okay, these are where the shoulder joints are, back of the leg is. Okay, and I'm also gonna move my branch over a little bit because I'm noticing where it contacts the Panda, it's like right around there. All right, not worried about the leaves. So following the backside here, I'm gonna just continue the work that I did for the tail. And if it even helps you to do this, if you flip it upside down, you can do that as well. It might help to get that furry texture. And I apologize for the shadow, just a moment. Leave some of that white space there, room for the imagination. Get that nice fur. All right. It's about 30 minutes left in class, so we'll just forego drawing any of the foliage just so that we can get a nice uh, finished sketch done because we have another exercise. And this is the, the, the next exercise is fun and exciting because it's more like a game <laughs> than anything. It's speed sketching. So right now we're focused on details, we're focused on proportions, we're focused on yada, 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 all the stuff that artists worry themselves with. In the next exercise, we're not gonna worry about any of that stuff. Our job is to document. If you think of yourself like a documentor every time you go hiking, then you're not only gonna have a very rich and entertaining hike, but you're also going to have a very rich and entertaining nature journal. Look at the way the fur, I'm gonna take a, a pause from the tail for a second. Look at the way the fur sort of follows the contour like this. These nice light lines, nice light lines like this to kind of give you a guide right? Because you're going to draw on top of these lines, but I'm just 
showing right here. I'm illustrating the angle change from top to bottom like that, okay? Once you get that done, you can go ahead and play with that as well, like as it goes and follows the horizontal angle. And then as it goes towards the top, it sort of lifts up a little bit like this very, very lightly. I'm just doing that with my pencil. Now, this isn't how to draw the fur. I'm just giving you a visual example of the way in which the lines curve up, then sort of even out, and then start to curve down. Now, what you can do is if you, if you wound up following me in doing this, is you can go ahead now with your pencil and just start to very loosely add some energy here preserving those little borders between the light and the dark for just adding this lively energetic stroke like that, following the contour. Don't, don't do it too much though, just no overkill. Wow, just enough, just enough to sell the illusion of fur. Okay, just like that. Because then when, on, when you get to the part where it's a little bit lighter, you can separate it a little bit more with some darker line like that and follow the way the hair grows there as well, just very lightly. Very light like that. Nice. Follow the contour of the body with the fur. Okay, when it starts to straighten out, straighten it out. Keep your eye on the reference photo. Then once it starts to turn down, once it gets towards the underside, then you turn it down like that. Just that angle. Overlap with the previous layer and you're golden. And just to reinforce, just to reinforce that separation between light and dark, you can add some of those little borders like that little bit of line weight variation, right? You want to get the underside looking a little bit darker. Go ahead and do that. Parts of the ear. Okay. Underside, like right over there, definitely. All right. So here is, this could take, <laughs> you can spend a really, really, really long time <laughs> um, rendering the fur, right? But that's the, that's the technique I wanted to share with you. You can continue this and finish this at your leisure, okay? We have one more exercise to do, all right? So we're gonna push pause on this drawing, okay? And we're going to continue with our next exercise. We only have about 20 minutes left. Wow, time flies, doesn't it? So keep working on this at home and email it to me, and I'll be happy to give you some feedback. All right? We're going to continue. So I'm going to share my screen with you again. And we're going to change gears because we have this whole process, right? Plan first, draw second, using the quadrants, connect the dot, all this kind of stuff. So the idea of this turning into a sketch means we need to change our mindset, right? We were architects, we were artists. Now I want you to adopt the mentality, not of an architect, not of an architect or an artist, but of like a reporter, a natural history reporter, okay? So when you bring your nature journal with you out into nature, you're not gonna have all day to sit and sketch an animal, especially if it's moving and, um, one of the best ways you can document what you're seeing is with rapid sketches and with notes, adding notes and text. That's gonna help document your experience, right? 
It's not about making a completely finished drawing. It's about documenting exactly what you're seeing and getting that data down on the page. So here is an example of a typical nature journal entry, right? And what you see here is four little mini sketches with notes. That's it, right? Because if you go on a single hike and you have maybe 10, 15, 30 of these little mini sketches, you're constructing a narrative of your experience on your hike throughout the course of the day. And you're going to have a very rich report of what you saw or what was happening in the um, ecosystem that you were just in. And over the course of many months or years, if you keep going on the same hike and you keep doing the same thing, you're gonna have a lot of interesting information to share with people about your, your local environment. And that'll help you become kind of a kind of an authority if you think about it. So what we're going to do next is we're going to complete a uh, an imaginary hike together. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't take you all on a hike with me. We're all here connected digitally. But um, I invite you to take another piece of paper, just flip over the paper you're working on right now, and to start with a rectangle. Okay, we're going to create a margin. And this is as much of a watching and looking exercise as it is a sketching exercise. So the first thing I'm going to have you do once you draw your rectangle, okay, is I'm going to have you divide your rectangle into four quadrants with a vertical line down the middle and a horizontal line down the middle. Okay, one, two, three, four boxes is what you should have, just like the setup on this page. All right. Now that you've done that, okay, I'm going to have you put your pencil down and fold your hands in your lap. And I just want you to observe, okay? So what we're going to do is I'm going to play a video clip for you. And for 15 seconds, I'm going to have you just observe what's happening in the video, okay? And then from memory, you're going to sketch and write what you saw, okay? You're just gonna use your memory from your direct observation to your memory. In fact, I'll give you more than 15 seconds. I'll let you watch the whole video and then you'll go ahead and you'll sketch vaguely what you saw, but you're gonna write down questions. You're gonna write down observations. You're gonna have a bit of time to really fill the first box in the upper left-hand corner with as much information as you possibly can. But first, we're gonna watch, and you're not gonna draw. You're just watching. Okay, I'm noticing there's a slight breeze. There's a lot of movement in the background. We have what looks like a beautiful rose with two bees. Getting busy, pollinating. What kind of questions are you formulating? Right? What species of bee is this, maybe? What species of rose is this? Is this a cultivar? Is this a wild rose? Okay. How many bees do you think are in that rose? <laughs> what other pollinators could be working? Are, are, are butterflies or hummingbirds or other types of bird, uh, pollinators working this background, right? So the idea is you're gonna take now, I'll give you uh, 30 seconds or 50, 20 seconds, 20 seconds to pick up your pencil and to start writing down these observations, right? From memory. You don't have to have a perfect rose, right? You can just write down different thoughts and different ideas. And I'll even share my camera with you. So we have our flower here in the foreground, right? This area, okay. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Okay, this is going to be like an orange rose. Um, we have our pollinators here. Crawling in and out of the different recesses of the petals. Okay, one question I have are, 
other pollinator? What's another species maybe, or, or um, is this a native plant? Say there's a slight breeze. Another interesting thing is if you look at the weather, what's the temperature? Right, that's another thing. Like in, in the, the United States, we use Fahrenheit. So let's say today we have a 64 degree Fahrenheit, clear and sunny with a slight breeze. Now you have a weather report. Okay. And you know what? You don't have to really do too much more than this. Because what we're doing, again, is we're thinking not like artists, not like architects, we're thinking like reporters. And if you can jam as much questions and information into this little square as possible, you're going to accumulate a lot of data from your hikes in your nature journal over the course of the day or a hike. Okay, let's try it again. This time I want you to actually pick up your pencils and rather than just watching and drawing later, I want you to watch and draw at the same time and sketch and write down questions and notes. And um, it should look something like this. You know, you can have your sketch, you should have your questions. Think about these types of things. How much time did that bee spend on the flower? How does this flower attract pollinators? Is it the scent? Is it the color? You know, things like that. Okay, so let's queue up our next drawing and we're just gonna draw for the duration of the video. Okay, so let's go ahead. We'll start in three, two, one and sketch. What do we got going on over here? All right, so this kind of looks like an Oriole. Look at that nest that's hanging from a branch. Oh, beautiful bird. What color was that as it flew away? So what, what we can do is if you don't have enough time to draw the bird, you can create iconography, kind of like in a football game, like draw a circle and an arrow. Let's say this is a uh, Oriole. So this is a nest. How many chicks or eggs? What kind of tree is this? Why does it prefer this kind of tree versus other trees? Is it closer to water, you know? I'm noticing the tree is budding. There's still some leaf development on it. Okay. Play it again. Okay, I'm noticing there's also another breeze. So we have leaf buds. Now the buds form during the summer. So this is last year's, last summer's buds that are now becoming leaves. Okay, because you'll notice on the trees there are buds all year, especially in the winter. Nest, what is this nest woven from? Okay, um, is there a pair of Orioles or is it just a one? Is this one of those species that just kind of splits once the uh, business is done? Okay, and that's enough. That's all you need to put in your box, right? So here's what I have is, um, okay, this is my Oriole. It's just a circle and I drew an arrow to the direction where it flew away. And you can even write, flew away. Okay, now I know the species because of the, the color. You can write that down. If you don't know the species, you can say orange bird or bird with orange breast. And based on the observation of this nest, this woven nest, okay, it doesn't have to look fancy, but nest woven from whatever, hanging from a tree. If you ask somebody, they can say, especially if they're birders, they can tell you, oh, you, you just saw an Oriole. Okay, and now you can write into your box after you talk to somebody, after you have that conversation. And now it's even more information rich because you learned what it was based on your direct observation. Okay, let's do it again. We got two more in 10 more minutes. Okay, so there's Mr. Oriole. Now let's go ahead, get ready. And we're gonna pick up our pencils again. And let's try another observation. Maybe this is something you see in your garden. Okay, interesting. What do we have here? Looks like two butterflies. What are they doing? Okay, might be some type of a mating ritual. 
Okay, I'm noticing these long antennae on the front, the patterns, where are they sitting on top of? That's another thing. Um, let's say, let's just write down what we see. Butterflies mating. Which is male and female? How do you know? Okay, um, what type of plant are they sitting on? Okay, it looks like these are still kind of budding as well. It is the spring after all. Notice anything about the weather? Is there anything different? Is it still, did the, did the breeze kind of calm down to allow them to do this? That's known as the environmental conditions, by the way. Whenever I start an, an, uh, an entry in my nature journal, I always start with the environmental conditions. That's the weather, that's the temperature, that's the time, that's the date, all of that stuff, very important. So I don't have all day to sit and draw. So let's say these are uh, butterflies with brown and white pattern on wing, okay? And that's all you need. Because before you know it, these two specimens might just fly away immediately and all you have is your memory, right? So what do you do? Okay, well, I had enough time to just basically scribble some notes, didn't really get a good drawing done, but that doesn't matter because it's not about the drawing at this point. It's about using your sketching skills to notice things so that you get more questions out of it or you get more facts out of it, right? The drawing is just the vehicle. So for our last one, let's go ahead. All right. And I'll share my screen with you again. Okay. And this time, what do we have? Oh, cool. A red spotted newt. Whoops, come here, you. Play. I usually see these all over the floor in the forest when it rains. And I love them, they're so cute. They're so fragile though. It's a shame that a lot of hikers crush them because they're not paying attention to where they're walking. <laughs> and I have a friend of mine who's a guide that will literally pick them up out of the trail and put them on a, under a leaf or something off to the side. Now, okay, we have the orange lizard, now uh, the newt. Now, what about all this stuff we see it growing? Like, what is this, this, this type of moss? Um, you know, we're in most likely a swamp or a forest, a wetland, maybe. So we have some debris, we have an orange newt. It's actually called a red spotted newt. And believe it or not, they can live 10 to 15 years. Who'd have thought? I usually think the smaller an animal is, the less time it, it's alive, but let's take a look at them again. That's a baby. Now they change from orange to a different color, but 10 to 15 years in the wild, this, this species can last. Think about it. If you do a nature journal entry on just one of these things for 10 or 15 years straight, what a book you would have. And you'd also be the foremost authority on the Eastern uh, Red Spotted Newt, which is a, is a prestigious title, I assure you. <laughs> okay, where do they live? That's a question. Probably under rocks and leaves and foliage. What do they eat? Probably insects. Does the diet contribute to the color? Or is there an environmental condition that contributes to the color? Usually something that is bright is venomous. That's another thing. Toxic? Now these do produce a sort of toxic toxicity. Not, not like a will kill you if you eat toxicity, but um, they produce a very nasty taste. So here is what I have for my speed sketching for my nature journal entry. Now, how do you tie all of this together? 
Well, let's go ahead and think about our first sketch that we did, right? Tie it back to the beginning of the class. We had our magnolia, okay? Well, we have the date, we have the location, and we have the subjects. So by combining these different elements together, 10th of April, where are we? We're, I'm in Brooklyn, so you can write where you, you are. If you have a park, let's say um, well, I'm in Prospect Park. <laughs> okay. I can add the environmental conditions too, you know, everything. And now you tied all of these tiny little messy thumbnail sketches into a pretty cohesive report, just like a natural history reporter would. Right. So over the course of this class, we worked together and learned the drawing system. Okay. This is something that we apply to all of our different uh, drawings that we do uh, from our botanical drawings to our landscape drawings and even to our critters here. We have a little bit more work to do on this, but that's your homework. I want you to finish that and send that back to me. And I'll also be sending you my finished sketch as well. But before we part ways today, I want to give you a couple of pointers on cultivating your practice. Right? This is some interesting stuff here. You don't want to forget what you learned. Um, so the best way not to forget is to use it before you lose it. All right. So obviously, spending more time outside is part of the solution. But really, you need those two factors, the intention and the focus. And again, what better way to channel those two things by, than by drawing. Um, great way to get Motivated is to sketch the things that interest you the most. Remember, you uh, start your nature journal or you start your sketches um, based on the curiosity you have around a specific thing. And you can even supplement that information with, by reading books and uh, learning more about that subject. By doing that with your drawing, you're not only teaching yourself, but you're putting yourself in a great position to um, teach other people what you've learned as well. So great place for you to do this is uh, to teach other people what you've learned is to share it, right? So we have a wonderful Facebook group. Uh, you can go to hike and draw, uh, sorry, facebook.com slash group slash hike and draw, post your drawings, post your photos from your hikes, post your sketches and share it with the community. It's a great way for you to uh, put yourself in the position of the educator. And um, we have some, uh, also some, these are some books that I recommend you read. I recommend them in every one of my classes. You can click through that at your leisure, as well as these um, additional resources. Okay, these are some nice tools that can help you in your nature drawing practice as well. Um, but we have more live workshops and I invite you to check them out. We have a landscape drawing workshop coming up next week. We also have uh, some more uh, interesting uh, stuff with our other instructor, Colin, Connor Nolan. Uh, he is a wonderful illustrator. He works on a lot of things like fantasy and sci-fi. So uh, if you want to think about using some more imagination and creating some characters out of your drawings, uh, we're going we're gonna to draw tree people with Connor um, on the 17th. We have a wonderful community, as I mentioned, once a month we get together for a live draw and that's totally free. So we will be practicing a wildlife gesture drawing that night. Uh, Earth Day is coming up on the 22nd. Stay tuned for a special announcement for a wonderful Earth Day event we're gonna be doing. And then we close the month off with a botanical drawing workshop. Now, I know that everybody's coming from different areas around the world, different uh, time zones. If you can't make these live workshops, we offer recordings. Um, but these recordings can kind of add up over the course of time. So if you're looking to save some money and benefit uh, from all of our recordings, we have a new membership platform that we launched last month. And this is where we keep our entire archive of video recording, recordings. So you can go to hikeanddraw.nyc to check that out. Um, you can check out all the different classes we offer there. And if you see like, you know, something that you really want to get more of, feel free to drop me a line and let me know. Also, there's a 30 day, no questions asked money back guarantee. So that's the, uh, that's the security of uh, testing this out at your leisure. So thank you all very, very much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure getting to draw with you and to talk about nature. And uh, if you felt like this was something you found value in, feel free to leave me a tip. I really appreciate that. There's my Venmo, Venmo handle. And also feel free to sign up for other workshops that we have. Um, and if you have any questions, just please feel free to ask. I'll be happy to be a resource for you. Thank you all so, so much. Thanks, James. You're very welcome. All right. All right. That was great. <laughs>